and admitting a couple of more. There we go. We are at the top of the hour, sir, so I'll turn it over to you to kick us off. Oh, sure. Good afternoon, uh, WKU undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, thank you so very much for joining uh, in today's uh, webinar. I am delighted to introduce Ms. Dawn Lipker. Uh, Ms. Lipker serves as the Associate Director of Academic Partnerships for the Southern Region with ETS. And she has spent over 20 plus years in higher education working on campuses in both admissions and recruitment. And Ms. Lipker is committed to lifelong learning and improving lives through opportunity and access to education. So in this next almost two hour webinar, uh, Ms. Lipker will provide an overview of the GRE general test, including the increasingly more popular at-home options and provide you with tips to prepare you better for the verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and analytical writing measures. I truly remain grateful to ETS over the past three years for helping uh, WKU students with such uh, opportunities that are customized for our students. So Ms. Lipker, I remain grateful to you and we look forward to an exciting presentation from you. Exciting, that, there's no pressure there. Thank you, Dr. Kudali. I appreciate the partnership. And hi, everyone, welcome to the session. Uh, as Dr. Kudali mentioned, we'll take about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, it depends on your questions. Um, but what my goal today is to really help present to you the getting to know the GRE General Test and Services. Uh, my name is Dawn Lipker. I'm an Associate Director for Academic Partnerships. And one thing you may not know about me is I'm actually from the great state of Kentucky. Um, I did not attend WKU, unfortunately. Um, I went to a different school, but now I live in Northwest Florida. So I'm very familiar with Bowling Green. I have family there. So I have a um, much love for WKU. Um, my goal today really is to help share some tips and strategies on not only getting to know the GRE, but helping you to be successful with the GRE. Um, one thing I would ask is if you wouldn't mind to just remain on mute, it just helps cut down the background noise a little bit but I do really encourage you to use that chat feature. So as I'm talking and going through things, feel free to add uh, your questions in the chat feature. We will get to them at the very end. And if for some reason we run out of time, I'll still follow up with you after we're finished today. And then a couple of more things you need to know is that we are recording the session. So once we're finished here, Dr. Kudali and his team will send you uh, the link so that you can access the recording as well as the PDF of the PowerPoint slide. And one of the reasons you wanna know about the PDF of the PowerPoint slide is all the tools and tips I give you today have hyperlinks in them. So you can access that information really easily. But also at the very end, I'm gonna share with you a discount code that you can use on registering for the GRE. So you wanna have that information as well. So as we jump into it, I wanna make sure um, everyone, I believe you can see my screen. If someone could give me a yes, that would be great. I can't see anyone. I'm assuming that's a yes. All right, I'm gonna take no response. Ah, I see a thumbs up, thank you. So everyone can see my screen at this time. So again, the goal of today is to uh, help you do your best, put you on the path of doing your best. When we finish, you're gonna know more about the test than maybe you ever even wanted to know. You're gonna know how it measures, um, how it's structured, tips for registering, which believe it or not is a big hiccup for some students, and what to really expect on test day, whether you're using a test center or as Dr. Kudali mentioned, the at-home version. What I'm also gonna give you are just some strategies on preparation, preparation materials. And then we also have some additional ways to help you stand out um, whenever you are competing and get some of those programs for other applicants. So as we look today um, at the GRE general test, it's accepted for graduate and business schools worldwide, but it's also accepted by an increasing large number of law schools. So whether you're interested in obtaining a master's, specializing in business masters, an MBA, a JD, or a PhD, the GRE is really your first step on that path to success. Just so that you know um, how it's changing, more than 1,300 business schools worldwide accept the GRE for their MBA programs. 
um, top business schools such as Harvard as well. And then for law school, there was actually a new um, session with the um, American Bar Association that they recently voted in favor for allowing uh, law schools to accept the GRE um, in place of law school admission tests. And that's effective immediately. So this really opens up your opportunities. But if you're like me and you're in your undergraduate career, like I was many moons ago, you may not know exactly what you want to do, but this does open up your options and that's okay because GRE scores are valid for five years. So you can take the test now, which is something we'll talk about in a few moments and something I highly recommend because those scores will be there when you're ready to make your application. So as we look at our options, uh, one of the things I want you to know is that the option is truly up to you based upon how comfortable you are testing. So when you take the GRE, you have the option to test in a test center or in the at-home environment. So let's compare the two. When you're looking at a test center, it's continuously offered throughout the year, um, available all around the world. But really when you go to a test center, what you need to know is that the test will be administered on a computer with a mouse, a keyboard, a monitor, and there will be a human proctor who actually walks around and watches the test takers. You're also video recorded during that entire session. When you're looking at the at-home version of the GRE, um, it's really taken that same GRE test, but from the comfort of your very own home. So it's um, available worldwide. So if you are traveling and you decide to take the GRE, you can take it as well uh, from uh, whatever that home is you're staying at that time. The good news is the content, the format, the whole on-screen experience, how you prepare for the test is exactly the same if you were to take it at home or in a test center. So you don't need to change how you prepare for the test. Additionally, the test fees, scoring scales, scoring options are exactly the same as well. If you need test taker accommodations, which we can go over those in just a few more moments, but accommodations would be if you need something like extra breaks, or extended time, screen magnification, selectable colors, different things like that. You can get those accommodations in the at-home version as well as the test center version, but you do need to request those before you register. And then finally, one thing you need to know about the home test that's a little different is that it's monitored by both a human proctor and by AI technology. So you are being recorded as well for the duration of the test. When you, uh, as soon as you log on, Till you complete the test, you are being recorded the entire time in the at-home version. So I mentioned this earlier and believe it or not, registration can be kind of daunting for some. So let me just share with you some of the tips and best practices um, in order to get you moving in the right direction. So step one, believe it or not, is just creating an ETS account. So you'll see on your screen right there, there's the create the account at the very bottom. Again, these hyperlinks are active when we send those to you. So creating your ETS account is what opens up for you the ability to sign up for registration. And once you do, it's really a good idea to review your identification documents before you create your account. You can do this. We have a few tips and tricks for you. You'll see the uh, GRE information bulletin there on your screen, just to make sure that you have the specific ID requirements. But the reason why we say this, ooh, I went a little fast, is you wanna make sure that you're entering your name exactly as it is on your ID documentation. So if you're using your driver's license, you want to use your, your full name just as it would be on your driver's license excluding things like accents, but you will enter your date of birth, your gender, your email address, your country, your address, your city, your postal code. All of this needs to match what is on your documentation. Why does that matter? Because you may be attending school at Western Kentucky, but maybe you're from the great state of Ohio. So if you are registering for the at home or the test center version, even though you're living in Kentucky at that time, your ID must match on the address and things that's on your ID. And usually that would be your driver's license. So it's not really where you're living now, but what your permanent address would be. And for us who um, live in the United States, that's usually what is on our driver's license there. So you're gonna wanna make sure that all of that information matches. And you also wanna make sure that if you see the screen right here, you'll see some asterisks and you'll see some areas that do not have the asterisks. You probably figured it out. If there's a red asterisk there, that means that the information is required. If it's not, um, has an asterisk beside it, if it does not have one, then it's not required. However, 
the more you fill out here, the better information that the programs have about you when it comes to test time. So let's look at just an example really quick in case you have some name questions. So if you look at this one, the test taker's name is Jose Fernandez de Cordova. The red star next to the fields that you see means that these are required fields and they must be completed. But as you can see, the first or given name is a requirement in addition to the last or the family name. Middle initial is not a required field. But in this example, the name Fernandez de Cordova includes an accent. However, when Jose enters it into the last or family name, he does not include the accent into our system because the system just does not recognize accents. But you do want to put the full family name or last name whenever you're entering the registration portal. Once you finish and finalize your ETS account setup, then it's time to register. So what you're gonna do first is you're gonna select a day and you're gonna base it on your earliest admission deadline for the schools you're, which you're applying to. So you gotta think of it sort of like reverse engineering. So if you're applying to a program and their application deadline is August 1st, then you want to sort of work backward on that a month or two in order to give yourself enough time to study, to register for the test, to get your test scores, and then determine if you would want to retest or use those scores. So when you're registering, you also see um, that you can um, sign up for what's called the JIRI search service as well. We're gonna talk about that more a little bit later in the presentation, but this is that area where it says, do you want to sign up for JIRI search service? There we go. You can also watch a short video on how to create your account and how to register for the GRE test. Um, you wanna register early, like I mentioned. You wanna review all the information on your identification card. You wanna have all of that handy, not only when you register, but the day that you sit down to take the test as well. So it's really important that you collect all that documentation and then you have everything with you. What you're gonna see on this screen as well as at the bottom, it says prior to registration, it says if you need accommodations, those are the accommodations I mentioned previously. Those would be things like you need screen magnification, you're asking for extra time, or maybe you need extra breaks. Whenever you go to this register link, it will ask you about accommodations. You do need to request those prior to registering. Um, I did have a question yesterday from someone who wears um, a hearing device. And they asked me, do I need to register for an accommodation because I use a hearing device? I said, yes, you do, because we do not allow anything that looks like hearing aids or earbuds or earphones without knowing uh, prior to you actually taking the test. So it's just to better help us securely monitor you and your test taking experience. So another thing you're gonna learn about that maybe you didn't know before is the GRE fee reduction program. I did not know about the GRE fee reduction program when I took the GRE many moons ago. Um, there's a plethora of criteria and it's really for individuals who can demonstrate financial need or they just meet certain criteria. I would have met this criteria because I was a first generation college student. Did not know it was an option, but there are many different um, criteria and eligibility requirements. We also have fee reduction vouchers that are distributed by national programs. So things like McNair and TRIO scholars, again, first generation students, uh, those are the types of organizations you can contact as well about the fee reduction vouchers. And they can be used on a couple of different ways. You can use a voucher to register for the jury general test uh, for 50% reduction of the test fee. Uh, when you do that, you also get uh, what's called Power Prep Plus. It's kind of a tongue twister, but we're going to go through that one in a moment as well. But it's really practice tests and also an item called Score It Now, which is the online writing practice test. And these are at no cost. So if you qualify for the fee reduction, then you get about $100 worth of free test prep materials as well. Now, ETS does offer free test materials, and I will share those with you, but these are in addition to what you can already find on our website. So what this slide's gonna show here is the system requirements, and this is extremely important if you're taking the GRE general test at home. 
Um, there's a couple of key things that we want to point out here. Because this is an online testing environment and because you're being monitored by human and AR proctoring, we do things like uh, running background scripts to make sure that there's no um, unauthorized software, dual monitors, things that are running in the background. Um, so you really want to do your computer requirements and those checks at least a week prior to testing. And here's why, because if you find that there's something that runs in the background, like I am an excessive user of Grammarly, <laughs> Grammarly just sort of opens whenever I turn on my computer. So I don't turn it off because I forgot that I had set it up. But a week prior to testing, we're going to do that background scan on your system, the system that you would use to take the test on. And if we see that those things are running, we're going to alert you to those things at that time. And we're going to say, hey, on test day, this needs to be turned off. You need to unplug your dual monitor. You need to unplug like an extra webcam or anything that you might have running. Um, we'll also let you know that you can't use the headset or earphones at that time. So you want to run it at about a week ahead of time just to give yourself any leadway or time in order to make any corrections. But please know that we're also going to run it the day that you test. So we're going to ask you to log on for the at-home test just a few minutes early. And we run that same background check again at that time on your system. So that's why it's important to use the same computer the whole time. A few things you're going to see on camera requirements, um, and this is true, I took the at-home version of uh, the TOEFL Essentials test that we offer for English language assessment because I wanted to, I really just wanted to see what the experience was like if I were a test taker. Um, so there are things that you're going to have to do with your laptop. You're going to have to show the human proctor a 360 degree view of your room including tabletop services underneath uh, the desk that you're sitting at or table that you're sitting at. You have to have your back to a door with the door closed. If you're in a bedroom, the closet door must be open. Um, there's a lot of things that they're gonna be looking for. So that's why you wanna log on early so that you can make sure that you get through all of those requirements. If for some reason, now this is really important, if for some reason your computer does not meet these requirements, or your setting or surroundings don't meet these requirements, you will not be able to test on that day. And I don't want that to happen to you. So make sure that you know, you're looking at the requirements at least a week ahead of time before you test so that you are up to date. So now let's take a look at the actual GRE test itself. So the GRE test is comprised of three measures. You've probably heard of these before. There's the analytical writing, the verbal reasoning, and the quantitative reasoning. We are going to start today with the analytical writing section. The reason why we start here is because analytical writing is the first section you will see on the test every single time you take the GRE. That does not change regardless if you're in a test center, at home, or if you take it multiple times. It always starts with the analytical writing measure. So when we look at this measure, this section really assesses your critical thinking and your analytical writing skills. And you're gonna be given two timed tasks. And what they're trying to do is assess your ability to do a few things, to articulate and support complex ideas, construct and evaluate arguments, and sustain a focused and coherent discussion. One of the questions I get here a lot is, is there, there a word count? There isn't a word count because there isn't a minimum or maximum number of words that you need here. It's also not gonna say um, a three paragraph essay. What we're looking for in this task is that you're able to support your thoughts, you're able to stay focused, regardless of the word count that you use. So you're going to be asked to write an essay for two different tasks, an issue and an argument task. Now, this is one of the reasons why we highly suggest if you're looking at grad school, it truly is a good idea to take the GRE, either your senior year, your junior year, right after you graduate, because if you decide to maybe take a few years off before you go back to grad school, and let's say you take two years off in your work and you're doing research or an internship, you kind of uh, get out of the habit of these types of writing tasks because you haven't been doing them every day. So it's really easy to go ahead and, and take the GRE earlier um, rather than later. And by that, I mean, if you're gonna take time off, taking the GRE whenever you're finished your senior year, or close to the end of your senior year, so that you can go ahead and use this, um, these fresh thoughts and these fresh practices that you've already have and do your very best for the analytical writing. So we're gonna look at a few things here. Um, you will type out your responses on the computer using a keyboard. 
Um, in a few moments, I'm gonna show you how you can write out your thoughts if you're doing the at-home test. We will give you scratch paper if you are in the test center. And then I'm gonna give you an, an example of what you can use in the at-home if you're the type of person that wants to write an outline first, that's fine. Um, you're also gonna get basic functions like uh, insert, delete, cut, paste, and undo. But please know that um, there is nothing like a grammar check or a spell check that's available for you. So now we kind of have a better understanding of the analytical writing. Let's talk about some tips and some strategies. Um, so before test day, you really wanna look at some topic pools for analytical writing measure. Um, to help you, we have published the entire pool of tasks. So if you do your due diligence and you wanna be prepared, I would suggest you look at this entire pool of tasks because we published them for you on which you will be uh, selecting for, which will be selected for you in your analytical writing. And so the ways that you can do this are, we're gonna show you the issue topic pools. You're gonna see a, there's a PDF under topic pools on your screen. It's broken down by issue topic and by argument. So you can actually see the pool of prompts that we uh, use in the analytical writing session to sort of prepare yourself and to practice so that you're um, putting your best foot forward. Before you take the uh, GRE general test, we do highly suggest that you review these strategies, these topics, sample essay responses, rather than really focusing on commentary or scoring for each task. This is gonna give you a deeper understanding of how the raters evaluate your essays and the elements they're looking for in those essays. Another tip I would have for you, and you see it right here on your screen, but it really is practice under timed conditions. Um, I had a question come through yesterday that said something about I'm a slow typer, I type very slowly, what would be some tips you have for me? I'm like, then practice typing in a timed setting. You know, when you're writing for a paper or an essay for a course, you can take your time. You can really be very thoughtful in your responses and you can be super prepared, but you're only gonna get about 30 minutes in order to formulate your ideas and thoughts and your final version. So you really wanna practice under timed conditions so that you are using the allotted time appropriately on test day. I also highly suggest that you read the directions. I know that kind of sounds silly, but there's gonna be very um, detailed task directions. So you wanna make sure that your essay addresses those specific instructions in order to do your best. And although there are GE raters, so humans who score your essay and the time constraints, you know, you still wanna do your best possible um, work. So you wanna give yourself enough time that you can do your draft, go back, reread it, make edits, under those testing time strength conditions. So now let's talk about the issue task. So on the issue task, you're gonna make sure you support your position on that issue with reasons and examples that are drawn from your experience, observation, or academic studies. Make sure again, you leave time to read and make any uh, revisions that you might need. Checking for obvious errors like uh, grammatical mistakes or misspelled words is really important. And finally, it's okay to uh, interject some of your personality, but you wanna make sure to avoid excess irony or humor in your essay responses, because it could be misinterpreted by the reader. So now we're gonna jump into the verbal reasoning section. So verbal reasoning um, assesses your ability to understand what you read and how you apply the reasoning skills. So if you think back to what I just shared with you, analytical is always first, but you could get verbal reasoning or the quantitative reasoning second. You will not know until you actually test. So I just picked this randomly. It doesn't mean that verbal reasoning will always come second. So keep that in mind. So what you're really gonna do here is there's some question types that you're gonna encounter. And it's really important to understand the question types so that you can really practice on your best responses. So the question types you encounter are gonna be things like reading comprehension, text completion, and sentence equivalence. So let's look at what some of these are gonna look like. On the reading comprehension, you're gonna see that there's multiple choice. So multiple choice might ask you to select one answer or more than one answer. So make sure you're reading those directions carefully because we do not give credit for partial answers. So if you only answered one part of it, but you missed that it asked for maybe an and or statement, you'll need to go back and um, select both answers in order to get full credit. 
Also, you're going to see select in passage. And what that means is you're going to be asked to highlight your answer within the provided text passage. So you can use your keyboard mouse or you can use your, uh, your mouse that's attached to your keyboard. But that's how you're actually going to highlight that answer within that uh, text passage. And then you'll see number two, which is text completion. So for text completion, you're going to see sentences that contain blanks. Uh, keep in mind, it's usually one to three blanks, but you're going to select the answer by selecting a choice for each blank presented there. And then finally, there's one called sentence equivalence. So on this uh, task type, you're going to be asked to select two answer choices from a list of six choices that when inserted into that sentence, create two sentences that are alike in meaning. So again, remember that Jiri does not award partial credit on these questions. So if you're supposed to provide more than one answer, in order to get that correct, you have to provide a correct answer for both passages that's being asked about. So we sort of went over verbal reasoning. So maybe you have a better understanding of what that's gonna be asked for in those test types. Remember, I'm gonna send you this PDF so you can access all of those tips yourself and find those exact websites. But here's some tips and strategies that you may not find just from a website. So when you're looking at uh, reading comprehension questions, make sure that you read that entire passage to get an overall sense of the message before you answer the questions. I know you kind of feel like that's maybe foundation or rudimentary, but a lot of people start panicking about the time and looking at the clock that's counting down rather than really focusing on what they're reading. So we highly suggest you read that entire uh, passage, make sure you're understanding what it's asked before you start to respond. You also wanna make sure that you answer on behalf of what it says and not trying to pull from any of your outside knowledge. This is not the time for you to interject things like research experience or intern experience if that's not what's being asked for in that task. Another thing to remember is after you choose your answer, admit this person, after you choose your answer for a question that contains a blank, Always a good idea, just a good rule of thumb to go back and reread that entire passage again, just to make sure that it makes sense and that it's in the right context. And if you're having trouble, you might want to try to fill in the blanks with your own words. So if you can't figure it out by the passage by which word to select, think about a word that you would use and then use that to match to one of the word options that's being available. I also use process of elimination. So if I can't find the exact answer, sometimes I will ask myself, okay, what is it not? What do I know that's not correct here? And then I can narrow it down that way. So the bullet points here will help you better understand the abilities that are being assessed in the verbal reasoning. So in order to support these questions that assess these skills, um, you have to be logically and radically complex. It can't be merely a collection of facts or assertions. So you're gonna see here the exact bullet points of what they're trying to identify, but really what they're looking for here is that you are um, logically correct, that it's rhetorically complex and it's not just facts or assertions, but that you have full, complete thoughts. So we get asked this question all the time, like how can I prepare? What are some really good reading materials? How can I find good level ready, level set materials? So what we suggest is that you look for material that presents an argument supported by reasoning or evidence. So where can you find that? You can find it in things like specialized academic journals, uh, you can also check out featured articles in news, New York newspapers like the New York Times, The Economist, Scientific American, London Review of Books. You can see those right on your screen. Um, trade books by experts and journalists for general audiences are also a good read. So what should you stay away from? Really textbooks and popular periodicals are not really good resources of material because they don't necessarily demonstrate the complexity that is found in GRE reading passages. So we want to really focus on um, the supported reasoning evidence materials, not necessarily those that are just maybe a good read. All right, so we've gotten through those two sections. So now we're gonna take a look at the third measure of the GRE, which is gonna be the quantitative reasoning section. 
So the quantitative reasoning section really assesses your ability to interpret and analyze quantitative information and solve problems using mathematical models. So in the quantitative reasoning section, there are really four question types. You're gonna see these on your screen. So one is the quantitative comparison where you literally compare data. Another is gonna be multiple choice. And these are multiple choice where you select one answer choice or multiple choice where you select more than one answer choice. So again, it's really important that you read the instructions and the directions to know if you have choose one or choose more than one. The third one you're gonna see is numeric entry. So these are numeric entry questions where you have to solve the problem for the correct answer and enter that answer in the appropriate field or fields. You have to actually enter those numbers as your response. So this measure really focuses on your basic mathematical skills of elementary mathematics, concepts of things like arithmetic, algebra, geometry, data analysis. And one thing you'll see that's on your screen right now is that the on-screen calculator is available during the quantitative reasoning section. Um, and there's a little calc button, which I'll show you in just a moment, that's at the very top of the screen. So whenever you um, process that calc button, that is when the calculator is gonna come up on your screen. Um, you also may be the type of person where you don't necessarily want the calculator button up all the time, that's okay. So once you um, depress that button again, the calculator will go away. So it's really good that um, to keep in mind that for the sake of time, if you're pretty good at estimation or other methods, you might not need the calculator every single time and that's fine. So you can pull it up or get rid of it as needed. And this is where you'll see it at the very top of the screen. And um, really, if you see the, it's marked at the top, you'll see the second button says calc. That's how you pull the calculator up or how you hide it as well. So we've really tried to make the, um, the user experience uh, test taker friendly so that you can approach the test using like your own personal test taking strategies. And by that, I mean, you have a lot of freedoms. You can go back and forth within a time section. So you can't jump from one section to another, but you can go back and forth within a section. And you can also reconsider and change your answers. You can mark, you see the mark at the top, you can mark questions that you answered to be able to come back and review them before exiting the session. So if you come across one that's just really stumping you and you don't wanna to spend too much time on it, you can mark that one and then come back to it as time permits. You can also skip questions you find difficult and return to them before exiting the session. Something else you're gonna see at the top of the screen there is a help button. Um, it's really important because it gives you directions for how to answer specific question types. Um, goes back over those directions or instructions you may have seen in the beginning. So it's just if you forget what you're supposed to do by clicking that help button, it will remind you or prompt you again on what they're looking for. And again, as I mentioned, that calc button, which is up at the top, you can press it once, the calculator will appear, press it once again, and that calculator will go away. So let's talk about some tips and strategies. I get a lot of question on tips and strategies for the quantitative reasoning because people just are um, wanting to make sure that they're studying the right materials. So um, keep in mind when you're taking the test, a few things, if you get like a geometry question, uh, the geometric figures may not be drawn to scale. So you might want to use that scratch paper that you'll get in the test center or the uh, whiteboard, which I'll show you in just a moment that you use in at home to draw them out to size or to scale for yourself. Um, so you wanna really draw them out and get a better understanding rather than estimating what you see on a computer screen. Another important tip is um, try to avoid lengthy calculations by rounding up, estimating your numbers, or looking for comparisons so that you're not spending an exorbitant amount of time or one or two of the problems. And make sure just like in the other sections as well, math is no different. Once you arrive at an answer, go back, reread the question, make sure that your answer is reasonable given to what the question is that's being asked. And make sure you review some additional problem solving strategies on our website. So you see that link at the bottom that says quant strategies that will actually give you some free uh, practice tests and tips on what you should study for and look for before you take um, the jury general test. So here's a few other things you need to know about the test itself. 
Both the verbal and the quantitative reasoning sections are this test are what we call section level adaptive. What does that mean? <laughs> what it means is that really it's the computer that selects the second section of each measure based on your performance on the first section. So if you do really well, if you have a strong performance on the first section, you're gonna receive more difficult questions on your second section. And that difficult lev difficulty level is taken to account in the scoring process, which the opposite is true as well. If you have um, a lower performance on the first section of any of the sections, then your second section is going to be less challenging and it will also be um, reflected in your scoring. My slides are jumping on their own. There we go. So your final score on each of the measures is based on your total number of questions that you answered correctly. And it includes the difficulty level of each question. Um, I do get asked all the time, like what happens if I leave something blank? I just don't know the answer to it. It's always better to answer a question, even if you have to make an educated guess, because points are not deducted for wrong answers. So you wanna give yourself the best chance you possibly can to be awarded the most points. So now I'm gonna walk through, so we've done the overview, maybe a few tips. So let's walk through sort of like the structure and the format so you kind of know what to expect. Now, as I, uh, a reminder, the first measure you'll encounter is always gonna be the analytical writing section. It's comprised of one section with two timed essay tasks. So you see on your screen there, analytical writing, always the first section. You have two tasks total and 30 minutes per task. So that's gonna be a total of 60 minutes on the analytical writing. When you look at verbal and reasoning, remember if I reminded you earlier that these could come in either order, but they're comprised of two sections as well. So these sections, again, they're gonna appear in any order right after analytical writing, but let's look at verbal first. So verbal reasoning is gonna have 20 questions and you have 30 minutes to complete each section. The quantitative reasoning contains 20 questions and you have approximately 35 to complete each section. So 30 minutes per task for analytical writing with two tasks, 30 for two tasks for verbal, which is another hour, and for quantitative reading, read, reasoning is 35 minutes. So this is why the test is about three hours with a few breaks and we'll go over those breaks as well. Now here's something you may not know if you've not taken the GRE before. And that is, and you'll see these bullet points over here, you may receive an unscored section or a research section when you take the GRE. Now you personally as a test taker, you're not gonna know if the section you're working on is unscored or scored. So you need to try to do your best on all sections. If you do receive a research section, it will be clearly identified and it will always be the very last section of the test. So whether you receive an unscored section or research section, your answers will not count toward your score. So the jury general test is totally approximately three hours and 45 minutes plus a timed break. And the time break, by the way, just comes a 10 minute break following that third section. But we always prompt you and let you know when it's coming. So now let's talk about the review screen. As I mentioned earlier, you can see at the very top there, the forward and the back. The review screen is really important because it's available all throughout your test. And what it really does is it permits you the opportunity to review the status of your questions in that section that you're in. So maybe you wanted to skip or mark a question to go back into it later. This kind of gives you an overall summary of where I am, what I've completed and what I might need to go back and revisit. So as you look on your screen, you're gonna see the table in the review section contains each question number that's about right through here. And whether you have answered the question, which is in the middle, and whether you have marked the question because you wanna go back and review it. Note on this one over here, you're also gonna see that if you have a status of incomplete, that means that you've not selected um, all the answers. Maybe it was one of those multiple choice that had more than one. So you've selected more or fewer responses than what it requires. So it's gonna be really important to go back to any of those questions that actually say incomplete in order so that you can complete those for full credit. And you'll say not encountered, you'll see on here means you haven't gotten that far yet. 
So we want to make sure that you know where you stand in each section, anything you may have missed, or anything that you marked because you wanted to go back and review, you're going to refine that at the very, very top in that review section. So when we talk about the sections of the GRE, we talked about the three measures. The th there's actually three different scores that you're gonna be reported on for the GRE general test. Number one is an analytical writing score. Uh, you're gonna see that this is reported on a zero to six scoring scale in half point increments, which means it could be 4.5, 5.5 or six. You're also gonna see the scores for the verbal and the reasoning, verbal reasoning and quantitative reasoning are reported on a 130 to 170 score scale. And those are only one point increments. So it could be 160, 161, 165. And the scores are good for five years, something I mentioned earlier. Now, I do wanna tell you just a little bit more about the analytical writing score. So. When you think about analytical writing, sometimes people talk about their combined uh, GRE. If someone says they're combining their scores, that usually means just the verbal and the quantitative. Now, we don't necessarily recommend um, that programs uh, combine scores because they're very different types of tests. But if you hear someone saying combined scores, just know that's what they mean because analytical writing is not included in there. So when we come to the analytical writing section, each essay receives a score from at least one trained rater. Again, they use that six point scale and we use what we call holistic scoring. So raters are really trained to assign the scores on the basis of the overall quality of an essay in response to that task. Remember how I mentioned that earlier, make sure you're reading the task so that you better understand what it's asking for. After it goes through that process, the essay is then scored by what we call an E-Rater scoring engine. It is a computerized engine that's developed by ETS that has the capability of identifying essay features that's relate to writing proficiency. So what we do is the human and the E-Rater score the, um, the essay closely enough, the average is used on the final score. And if they disagree, then a second human is brought in in order to sort of like break the tie there between the two. So it's really our um, process to try and give you the best benefit and best advantage by using both human and AI. But if there is a result that the there's a difference in scoring, then there's another human that's brought in from um, the outside in order to be able to evaluate and review as well. So it's really trying to give you the best benefit and um, um, the highest score we possibly can based upon the work that you've done. So here's some more score interpretation resources. Now, I'm not gonna tell y'all, y'all need to read all this. Um, a lot of this is just uh, the, like that 30,000 foot um, level trying to figure out the information. But if you really wanna know more about, you know, what do my scores mean? How do institutions use these? How do we as a company advise institutions and programs to use them? We wanna be very transparent with you. So these are the types of materials that we actually give to our score users. That's what we call like your graduate programs, Dr. Kudali and his team. These are the resources we give them to help guide them on scores that they use, but we wanted to make them available to you as well, just so you had an understanding of the resources that we provide. All right. so. We've gone through the, the, the meaty parts of it. Let's talk about just some overall general tips and strategies to help you really put that best foot forward. So we're gonna start super basic here, um, but it's really to help you better understand what to expect. So I mentioned this earlier about reading all the directions. It's really important that you become familiar with the question formats and the directions before test day. You know, if you were to get a practice test, maybe for something you're doing in college right now, that would certainly help you prepare for the real test. Although you're not going to know what order or the questions that are going to be asked, we do provide those materials so that you do have an understanding of each task, how the questions are worded, what's going to be asked. So that's what we mean by familiarizing yourself with question formats and directions before test day, because we don't want you to spend a lot of time on the test trying to understand what the directions mean. We want you to understand those before you come in. So as far as free resources go, we have what's called a power prep practice test. 
Um, we have an even deeper look at GRE. This is just sort of a superficial look, but we do offer like a three hour deep dive if anyone's really wanting to, to jump in and learn a lot more. And those are resources that I will provide Dr. Kudali and his team, and he's gonna share out with you all as well. But I'm also a resource. Um, so you can reach out to him in his office and um, ask to get in touch with me and I'll be able to provide you resources that way as well. So let's talk about one more thing. I know there's a lot on the screen here and it's really about time management. Um, you want to be cognizant and aware of your time. Also don't wanna rush. Let this individual in. Um, to help you with your pace, there is a section clock. So the section clock is gonna appear on the screen so you know how much time you have during the section. But if you're the type of person where that might be a stressor for you, that's okay, you can hide the clock. So you can pull that clock up just like the calculator. You can pull it up to see, okay, where do I stand? How much time do I have? Where else do I need to work? Or you can hide it if you don't want it. The one thing you don't have control over is the last five minutes. So anytime we get down to the last five minutes of a section, that clock is going to appear just to let you know that you need to start wrapping things up. And we want to have you so prepared that when that clock pops up, all you're doing is reviewing your answers, not scrambling to try and finish that section. <clears throat> Again, one best strategy to keep in mind is just to answer all the questions, even if you have to take your best educated guess. You do not get credit for partial answers, and you do not get deducted on any questions that you get incorrectly. So even if it's something you're not 100% sure of the answer, take your best educated guess, hopefully it'll work in your favor. All right, we kind of talked about this one before on tips and strategies, and it's really not wasting time on those questions that you find too challenging or difficult. Mark them, come back to them at the end. When that five minute clock comes up, if you still don't know the answer, that's when you make that best educated guess. Um, another really important um, item to know is that not one question carries greater weight than any other question. They're all uh, weighed equally. So it's always best to provide an answer to every single question that's being asked. Uh, I mentioned that review screen earlier too. We want the review screen, remember that's the one that has the tables on what you've answered or what you've unanswered. We truly want that review screen to be something that helps guide you, but you don't want to get into a habit of answering a question, now jumping in and checking the review screen to make sure that it's recorded. It will be recorded when you hit the next button. Really use that review screen when you're getting toward the middle or toward the end, just to make sure you're on pace, but we don't want you to focus on that and uh, run out of time on the tasks at hand. Okay, so we talked about registration. Uh, we've talked a little bit about all of the tips and strategies for the measures. Next, what I wanna share with you is what to expect on test day. So there's a couple of different things, whether you're in a test center or you're at home, um, regardless of your location, you're still gonna need that ID. So that is that um, your photograph ID, usually it's your license. Um, it's gotta have your name exactly like you registered for the test. Um, signature and photograph is usually included. Um, it's going to have things like your address and, and uh, city zip and state. But one thing you want to bring with you in mind is you want to have in mind with you before you test, what are the schools in which you would like to send your scores? There's a reason for that. Um, you don't have to remember any codes or anything like that, but the day that you take the GRE, you have the opportunity to release your scores for free to four different schools. If you decide you want to apply to five or six programs, there is an additional fee for that fifth or that sixth. But here's the problem. If you take the GRE that day and you decide, I don't know if I want to send my scores now or not, you lose that opportunity to send those four free reports if you wait and send them later. We really want you to make sure that you're not having to um, um, overextend your spending here. So make sure you go in mind with those four schools. If more, you need more. I think it's like $27 for an additional school report, but at least you get those four for free. So have in mind with you the schools and the programs you're wanting to send those scores to. Uh, one thing you're going to see here, this is more for the, um, the test day in the test center, but you can't bring personal items into a test center. 
there will be breaks and you'll have a locker that you can go in. You can keep water, you can keep snacks. If you're doing the at-home test, we'll give you a break as well where you can get up and go to the restroom. Um, you can have water and snack um, once you leave. Now, when you do come back uh, from your break, you will be asked to um, show your identification again. So if I'm taking the at-home test, I'm going to have to do facial recognition and show my ID again to make sure that someone's not sitting down in my place. Same thing with the test center. If you get up and you take that scheduled break and you come back, um, the proctor is going to check your ID again. You're still going to be recorded just to make sure that um, everything is, uh, you are who you say you are. Um, so showing that ID you're also going to have to show your computer screen and things again in the at home. So you're going to have to go through that security check one more time. And just remember, if you are doing the at home test, the entire session is recorded. So even when you get up to go take that 10 minute break um, and you come back, that's that moment in time is still being recorded. And I can't tell you how important it is if it's a 10 minute break. It's just 10 minutes. You don't want to come back late because the time will start click, uh, ticking along and you will lose that time if you take more than 10 minutes. So this is what I mentioned a little bit on the at-home test. In the test center, we're gonna give you some scratch paper and a pencil. You cannot, you cannot bring any materials from outside. You also can't leave with those materials. But in the at-home environment, you have a couple of options. Um, so you can have um, a whiteboard with an erasable marker. It doesn't have to be something super fancy or expensive. You can get these at a dollar store. Um, five below has them, I know for sure. Uh, but you can get a small whiteboard. And that's for you to have the opportunity to be able to write out some of your formulas or some of your thoughts. Now, please know in the at-home environment, when you finish writing your notes or your thoughts, you do have to show that to the proctor. And once you're finished, you do have to erase it. And you also have to show that to the proctor. The second option for at home, if you can't do the whiteboard, is you guys know what sheet protectors are. You know those transparent sheet protectors. You can put a piece of white paper in there, and then you can use your um, dry erase marker to actually write on that paper, that transparent piece. And then you also would have to be able to erase that and show that to the proctor when you're ready to move along. Here we go. So some more things you need to know, I sort of mentioned this, but at the very, very start of the test, whether you're a test center or you're doing the at home, um, your picture will be taken and a sample of your hand, handwriting will be collected, but only in the test center is the handwriting collected. Your photo is taken for whether you're at home or you're in a test center. If you're at a test center, you will be scanned by handheld metal detector. So just keep that in mind to make sure you're not carrying electronic devices. That's when you'll receive your writing utensil, your supply of scrap paper. They'll also remind you at that time, you know, no headphones, no smart watches. You have to leave your cell phone and things like that in the locker. Um, when it comes to the scrap paper at the test center, you'll be able to replenish that throughout the test as needed. But as I mentioned before, you are not allowed to take that from the test center for security purposes. And I know I mentioned this before, but just so that you're aware, in the test center, there will be human proctors and they do walk around during the test. We tell you that now just so you're not surprised. And you're also going to be under electronic surveillance the entire time. Now, the equivalent to that in the at-home experience, remember, is you're going to be monitored by human and AI proctoring, and you're going to be recorded the entire time. Because we really know that the majority of test takers, um, they um, really work hard to take the test. We want to protect them and their security. This is what I mentioned before about that um, final systems check. Remember I mentioned a week before you test, you wanna run that systems check to make sure that things are um, uh, working and that you have Grammarly or a dual monitor and things like that turned off. But before you start the test, we're gonna actually ask you to run a final systems check and fix any issues before. Again, all of those issues must be resolved before the GRE starts. So you'll need to close all your browsers, any applications that's not needed for the test. And um, I actually suggest like if you're testing at home, if you have a lot of electronic devices in your home that are pulling on your same Wi-Fi, I would possibly turn off the Wi-Fi to those things, whether it's, you know, a PlayStation or uh, your phones, or if you have a bunch of tablets, I would consider turning those, um, the Wi-Fi off for those materials so that you're really um, not having any connectivity issues. If you do have connectivity issues, 
we do reach back out to you to try to get you back on and to log back in. But we'll also give you a phone number whenever you log on. So if for some reason, you know, you hit bad weather or you lose connectivity, you have a number that you can call to try and get reconnected. Um, please understand as well, if you are more than 12 minutes late to start the test, your test will be canceled. So remember, you have to run those background checks, that scan, you have to do the, uh, the scanning of your computer, you have to be checked for your identity. Um, so you don't wanna hop on to your GRE like minutes before, you really wanna start this process 30 to 20 minutes before your testing time. So how do you get help if you are um, at home? You know, in a test center, you would just raise your hand, but if you're using the at-home environment, there's actually a couple of ways that you can get their attention. We have a chat feature that's called Log Me In, and you can uh, chat with the proctor that way. Just keep in mind, it may take them like 30 seconds to reply, so they're not ignoring you, but there is a time delay there. Um, if the proctor is attempting to chat with you, there's gonna be a little blue owl that bounces up and down in the corner. Um, that proctor will also tell you that you can wave at the camera and they will come on and chat with you and ask you, what is it that you need? Is there any way that they can help you? Keep in mind, if you forget to erase your notes, remember that whiteboard or that transparent paper, if you forget to er erase that, the proctor is going to contact you. They're going to say, please erase your board and show me that erased board. So I don't want that to throw you if that were to happen. Um, but again, if you do have any technical issues, you can reach out to the proctor at that time or there is a number that you can call. Speaking of calling, uh, many of you like me keep your cell phones very close to you. When you're doing the at-home test, the um, proctor is going to ask to see your phone and they're going to ask for you to show them all four corners of your computer screen. And then they're going to ask you to take your phone and move it to an area behind you where they can see you put it down. Number one tip, during your 10 minute break, do not pick up your phone. <laughs> uh, you're not allowed to touch your phone once again when you're in the testing room. So you do need to have it with you in order to get yourself um, logged in and security checks. But when you go on that break, you need to leave your phone there um, or they could cancel your test. So please keep that in mind. What are some more things that you need to know? Well, there is a 10 minute break after the third section and there's like one minute breaks between the remaining sections. Not a whole lot of time. So you just wanna know that going into it. If you need to take an unscheduled break, your time does not stop. Um, in a test center, you have to tell the proctor and they say, if you've gotta go, we understand you've gotta go, but your time for that section is continuing to run. Same thing in the at home. You know, if you need to make an emergency um, run somewhere, then you need to tell that proctor and they have the opportunity that time to monitor you. And if you don't come back, you're going to cancel your test. So you just want to keep those things in mind ahead of time. Those break times cannot be exceeded, um, but you are allowed to leave your seat during that 10 minute break. You can stretch up, you can rest, uh, you can stretch, you can go to the restroom um, and keep in mind, again, the AI technology will verify you throughout the test. So when you come back from those breaks, you will have to go through those security scans once again. All right, that was a lot. You're drinking from the fire hose. You're doing a great job. Um, so now you have an understanding of what to expect, hopefully. Uh, you have an understanding of the registration process. We're going to talk about sending scores. And this is where some students get a little like panic, like what are my options here? What if it's my first time and I don't know if I want to send my scores? You do have options. So after that last section of the test, you're going to be asked, do you want to cancel your scores permanently? Under no circumstances do we recommend that you cancel your scores permanently. You really need these as a baseline. If you feel like you didn't do your very best, you didn't study, um, you felt like you could do better, I would not cancel your scores. You don't have to send those scores to an institution, but it's really great for you to have those so you can understand how you're going to grow if you do decide to take it again. Um, some schools do what's called a My Best Score. My Best Score is super scoring. So the, if you take this, the GRE more than once, instead of looking at each individual, they take your highest. Not every, school, not every school does this, understand. But most schools will do the super score, but they'll take your highest analytical, your highest verbal, your highest quantitative. So we really don't recommend that you cancel those scores permanently because we can't get them back if you select yes here. 
we recommend that you do review and report your unofficial scores because at that time, at the very end of the test, you're actually going to see your unofficial because it still has to go through review process, but your unofficial verbal and your unofficial quantitative reasoning scores. So you'll have an idea of what you scored. Um, you won't see the analytical writing yet because remember that goes through humans as well as e-rater. Now, if you're not happy with your scores, you can choose at that time to not send your scores. So that's why we wait to the very end to enter the schools in which you want to send your scores. Because if you're like, ah, I'm going to sit on these, I could have spent more time studying or preparing. That's fine. You don't have to send them at that time. You always have the option to decide later. Um, and something I'll tell you about, too, is called the score select. Score select is where you can select multiple scores or an individual score to be sent to um, an institution. So let's look at that experience. So this is how you would actually view your unofficial scores once your test is over. So you're going to get a screen that looks literally exactly like this. This is an actual screenshot um, of this um, unofficial score report screen. It's going to show your verbal reasoning, your quantitative reasoning on here. And after you review the scores, that's when you can decide whether or not you want to send them to your um, four institutions for free. If you decide you don't want to send them at that time, that's okay too. You don't have to send them then. Just keep in mind that if you do decide to send school reports after you leave the test center or after you finished um, that session of the at home, it's about $27 to send uh, one school report. So let's talk about score select. Score select is where you have the option to put your best foot forward as far as your scores go. So let's say you take the test once, or let's say you take it once now and you take it again in three years. You have the option to only send the scores to institutions that you want them to see. And this option is only available with the GRE test. So on test day, when you view your scores at the test center or at home, you can designate those schools to receive either your most recent test scores from all the tests you've taken in the last five years, or just one set of test scores. So you get the opportunity to determine if you want the school to get every single GRE you've ever taken or just the best um, GRE scores and outcomes. They're both available for you. They both have those four, screen, four free score reports. And remember, um, if you wanna send score reports, all you have to do is sign back into your ETS account and you can designate those schools um, to receive the score reports. But this is for those in individuals who maybe test more than once, but they only want to send their best scores. That's what score select means. So once you take your test, you'll be able to decide if you wanna send them. Remember, they're good for five years. So if you take the test, let's say tomorrow, and you sit on those scores, you can wait three years before you send them. That's perfectly fine and up to you. They are good for five years and schools will take them for up to five years. Now, let's say you do wanna send your scores right away. You don't wanna sit on them, you don't wanna wait. This is an exact screen that you're gonna see. The screen will come up, it'll appear. And you'll see the little blue tab there that says to add a score recipient, select the blue box and you actually select add a score recipient there. And next you're gonna see the country, the score recipient from the drop-down list. So you would hit your United States and then a list of institutions will be displayed and you select the desired institution from that list. Again, please keep in mind, you get four free reports on your actual testing day. Now you may uh, see a department, which is great. Uh, you know, graduate programs, um, a lot of them will maybe have a department code versus just an institution code. So if you know that they have a department code, you can actually go even deeper and select um, that department name as far as that option, or you can just have them sent to the institution. Either way, they're gonna make it there. Um, if you select the department specifically, sometimes it gets there a little bit quicker than selecting the, just the institution because a lot of times that goes to like a centralized admissions and it may take a little bit longer before the graduate committee actually gets your test scores. They will receive them, um, but just keep in mind if there is a program specifically you're sending it to, we highly recommend you select the program here instead of just the institution. 
So how do you know when you're gonna get your official scores? So it takes about 10 to 15 days after you test. And remember that's because the um, analytical writing is being verified. So about 10 to 15 days after you're gonna be able to view your scores in your online ETS account. It's gonna include all your scores and your hit re, uh, score history in the last five years. So you'll be able to do a few things. You can print a copy for yourself, for your personal records. If you're applying to a grad school and they're like, oh, I'll look at your, your unofficial official records first, that's fine. You can print them off and give them to them as well. Um, if you decide not to send scores to schools, that's okay. You can still log into your ETS account anytime within that five year period in order to have those sent. And if you need help, like if it just, you know, it makes sense to you now, but let's say two years from now when you're trying to send your scores and you kind of forgot all of this, it's okay. There's a really short um, video. You'll see that link right there. ASR means additional score reports. Just reminds you how you log in and how you can um, order additional score reports at a later time, again, within that five-year period. The whole point of the score select option is to help you put your best foot forward. But if for some reason you decide that you're not happy with your GRE um, scores, and maybe you didn't put enough effort into it, I'm gonna be 100% transparent with you and tell you I did not study for the GRE when I took the GRE and my scores reflected it. Um, I don't wanna retake it myself. Um, but if I needed to, I would study for it this next time because there was plenty of free test prep materials. I think I just personally underestimated um, some of the questions and some of the task types. I did get hung up a little bit in the directions and the instructions, ran out of time in a few areas. So the fact that we have like these free test prep resources, I highly, highly recommend that you take a look at them. Someone asked me um, recently, is two weeks enough time to prepare for the GRE? My response to that would be kind of depends on the test taker and the type of student you are. But for me, no two weeks would definitely not have been enough time. I would have taken probably three months. Now I wouldn't have studied every single day, but I look at preparing for the GRE just like you would for a comprehensive exam. You wanna spend a little time on it every single week. Maybe you pick every Tuesday from two to four, you're gonna work on studying for the GRE. So this Tuesday, you're gonna work on just the uh, analytical writing. Next Tuesday, you're gonna study up on the verbal. The Tuesday after that, you're gonna do the quantitative reasoning. So you really wanna approach it just like it's coursework. And that way, you know what to expect and you can do your very best. But let's say you take the test, didn't turn out the way you wanted to, you can retake the test in 21 days um, for a continuous rolling 12 month period. So if you didn't do your, um, your best or what you think you could have done, you think you could have gotten um, a better score, then you can wait 21 days, study up, do those practice tests and you can retest again. So here's something that a lot of people don't know and a lot of people don't take advantage of. Um, if you really want to know uh, how well you did on the test, your performance on the test, other than just the scores, like you really want to break it down and understand what were some of the areas that you could that maybe you struggled or some of the areas in which you were really um, strong and had, you know, real strength in, you actually can get a free GRE diagnostic service. This is through your ETS account again. But what this diagnostic service does is it gives you information on how well you did on the verbal reasoning and the qualitative reasoning on the test that you took. You actually get to see a summary of all the questions you answered right, but even more importantly, a summary of all the questions you may have gotten wrong and the difficulty level of each question and the time that you spent on each question. So it's really um, helpful if you're planning to take the GRE a second time. It takes about 15 days after you test before you can um, actually access a diagnostic service, but it's absolutely free and it's good for up to six months after you test. So if it is something that you want to look into that is a free service within your ETS account, I highly suggest um, if you're looking at retesting or you just want to know how well you did in some areas that you just select that free diagnostic option and just see for yourself. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, this is just a sample of the verbal and the, um, the verbal reasoning section in the diagnost diagnostic service. It's going to show you the questions in each verbal section and how they're organized by question type. So in this example, which you're seeing here, the test taker saw a total of seven longer passages reading comprehension questions. 
three were answered correctly and four were answered incorrectly. So the table kind of represents the difficulty level of each question and the time spent on each question. And you can also see in that hyperlink there, it says a description and sample questions. It gives you a better understanding on the areas that maybe you got incorrect. So you can actually see those as an example and you know what you can work on to get stronger if you decide to retest. Okay, we're wrapping it up, I promise. You are hanging in there, I know. I see we've got three in the chat. I will get to you in just a moment. Um, let's talk about the test prep information, like I mentioned. So test prep information is available on our website. You're gonna see the link at the very bottom here called that says prepare. This is the information that Dr. Kudali and his team will share with you. Um, in this test prep, you can review all the sections um, that includes advice, um, sample questions, scoring guides, tips for how to respond, being familiar with each task type and test question type. You're also gonna see a power prep tool this contains information to help you understand those test types, test features, familiarize yourself with the test questions. Um, and these are also going to be in your ETS account. It's under my test preparation. I really encourage you to access that Power Prep Online test. It really is sort of like a mock test and can help you better understand and get familiar with the GRE General Test itself. Um, there's a test prep booklet that you can download here. Um, one word of caution is that there's a lot of test prep companies and a lot of companies out there that um, charge for these types of services. Um, if they are not offered by ETS, um, then we don't endorse them. That's why we put these materials out here because these are free materials and these are materials that we developed and they're developed by the same individuals who developed the sections of the GRE test. So they're the closest thing you're going to find to the actual test itself, and they are free. Now, if you want a really, really deep dive, there are some power prep tools you can pay for. The majority of what we can offer you, though, are those free services. There's a, a whole thing on math review and math conventions. It's about a 100-page refresher. Uh, so it's a quite a lengthy read, but at least it'll give you a better understanding of what's going to be um, on the, um, the exercises in the quantitative math section. Um, there's also things like the Khan Academy. I'm sure you guys have heard about the Khan Academy or Mathnasium, which is what we have here where I live. Um, and you can actually get some test prep materials from them as well. So what do we have for you? So we do have a promo code. You can see it on your screen right now. You can take a snapshot of it. You can um, write it down. But again, you will receive this slide deck so you'll have it. The promo code that you see on your screen right now, which is WK3102230, will give you $30 off the registration of the GRE general test. Now, this does expire 45 days from today, but that doesn't mean you have to test in 45 days. That means that starting from today, within the next 45 days, you would need to at least register for the GRE test, but you can take it within the next six months. By using this code that will give you $30 off, the GRE general test is $220. So that would be a $30 discount on that. And I will send, like I mentioned before, the GRE test prep materials, and that would give you enough time to prepare for the test before then. Something else to remember, I mentioned the student, uh, the link for the fee reduction services. So that will be included in here as well. So for those of you who want um, to be eligible or to see if you qualify for the GRE fee reduction uh, program, that could be in addition to this promo code. Okay, so we talked about additional ways to help you stand out, right? You're going to grad school, maybe you're going to stay at WKU, maybe you decided you're going to go elsewhere. Um, I'm going to show you just a few little things that will help you stand out. So I mentioned the GRE search service in the beginning. So the way that the GRE search service goes is when you sign up with your e ETS account and you register for the GRE, it's going to ask you, would you like to opt in to the GRE search service? And by selecting yes, your unique portfolio, the information that you put into the search service allows graduate schools, business schools, law school recruiters all the way around the world to use this service to find you and really to um, recruit you. Um, if you match the recruitment profile that they're looking for, they will send you information about their programs, um, admission requirements, scholarships or fellowships to help pay for tuition. And it's free, you just opt in and those recruiters can reach out to you. 
But if you say, hey, I want to drive this uh, conversation myself, then we have another free resource for you. And that's called gradschoolmatch.com. And I love this site because this is a free site for you. And what we do is we ask you to go in and you create your free profile. And what you do there is you just highlight your academic goals. What experience have you had? What is it that you're looking for? Where would you like to study in the world? Uh, what programs are you interested in? And then you can search out programs that match those areas of interest. So we do the, the matching algorithm on the back end. So you put in what you're looking for. We match you with institutions, but here's a really great thing. You reach out to them. So we will present those to you in a list format of, hey, based upon what you're looking for, these are some schools you might want to consider. And then you decide if you want to take the next step and contact them and learn more about their program. Um, it's also a really good like organizing platform. So you can go in and you collect like all of your application information. What are the admission requirements for all of these programs? Who have I applied to? Who am I considering? Um, and the best part for this um, if you're like me, you're like, I don't want to put my profile anywhere because I don't want to be solicited to all the time. This is a um, one thing about ETS people don't know is we are a nonprofit. So really, our mission is to um, advance access and equity in education. So we don't sell your information. Um, if you have a matching profile with the school, we just let the school know that you match them. We let you know you match the school and then you all decide if you want to talk. We're not gonna take that information and go and sell it um, out uh, in the market somewhere. So um, we just wanna make sure that you're getting the best fit for your graduate uh, master's or PhD program. All right, so resources, we're almost finished. Taking a look at uh, the uh, free resources again, the website is huge. It's gonna help you know about test dates and policies and locations. There's so much you can find here. I will send you the links for this information. Again, um, you can find that information bulletin that I sort of referenced before. Um, it talks about those accommodations that we mentioned for people who may have health-related needs or who just need um, extra time in taking the test. It's also gonna let you know who actually um, receives those GRE scores at the schools, the business schools, the law schools that accept GRE for those different programs. You can find a wealth of information here as well. And then finally, if you just kind of want to hear what other people are saying, there's the official GRE test, book, uh, test page on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. There's tons of GRE videos on YouTube. I would highly suggest some of them are pretty um, entertaining. Uh, the ones that we are created from ETS are the ones that I would highly recommend you use to study for. Um, there's a lot of different things out there, but the ones that are uh, curated by ETS are the ones that will give you those real true study tips and tricks. Um, and then you'll see some of the other ways that you can reach out to other students who are taking the test. All right, so more information. I'm gonna share all of my information with you, but right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the chat feature. So I am going to stop sharing, maybe. Pause the share here. All right, so we are gonna go into the chat feature really quick, see what questions we have here. Okay. So Casey asks, so we do not bring our own calculator because the one provided in the test does all we need for it. Correct, Casey, you cannot bring your own calculator actually. Um, the one that we provide within the test itself is the one that you'll need to use. So you don't need to bring, you don't need to bring any materials. Again, you don't even need to bring, if you're going to a test center, you don't even bring scratch paper or pencil that will be provided for you. And then if you're doing the at-home test, again, that calculator is gonna pop up on the screen. You will need to provide either that whiteboard or that transparent sheet with the white paper in between so that you have a scratch sheet. I highly suggest doing that. Um, even if you think that, you know, hey, I probably won't need this for anything. It's just a comfort level to have that information or those resources if you need them. Let's see. If we're taking the test and not applying to programs yet, should we still send our scores? That's a great question. And that came from Shaya Camp. It depends, what I would suggest to you is if those are programs that you know you're going to apply to, um, if you're gonna apply to them within the next academic or calendar year, yes, go ahead and send your scores to them. If you're not gonna apply to that program for two or three more years, I would possibly hold on to them because what happens is 
the, the graduate program and the admissions, they have a repository of scores, right? They'll keep those scores in their system, but they do purge those from time to time. So if they don't know when you're applying, um, if you don't contact them with that information, then they don't know how long to hold on to that score. So if you're not going to apply for a couple of years to that program, then I would just wait and have your score sent later. Um, that usually works out best. I did pronounce it correctly. Thank you, Sletna. I'm from Kentucky, remember? So sometimes my, my grammar is not the beta, uh, best sometimes. All right, let's see. Would the jury general be better to take as opposed to jury subject in terms of... Yes, that's a great question, Patrick. So... When it, you think about the jury subject test, I think that's what you're, yeah, subject jury. The jury subject test is, um, it depends on the program that you're applying to. Very few programs that I'm aware of require the jury subject test. But if I would look into the program specifically first, and if that program says they require the jury subject test, then yes, I would take the jury subject test. If they do not require the jury subject test, then I would contact that program to see if they even want you to take it or not. Some, jir some programs use the jury subject test as a diagnostic tool to better understand your level of knowledge coming into that program. But here's the thing to keep in mind, Patrick, is if you want to apply to more than one program, you may have more than one requirement that you want to meet. The jury general test will meet all of those requirements, but the subject test is really based upon each individual graduate program. Um, I hope that helped answer that. So the long story, uh, I guess the short story would be, it depends on the program, but that is an opportunity if you want to take that jury subject test. I wouldn't recommend it unless the program itself requires it, however. Let's see, how long before the application window closes would you take the jury? That's a great question, Madeline. So I sort of reverse engineer it, right? So um, I don't, if someone has an application deadline and we're just gonna make this up, let's say they have an application deadline of May 1st. I am not going to wait to send my materials in, um, you know, at the end of April. I wanna be able to have my materials into that admission committee in enough time. Cause a lot of times I, I did admissions for years um, on the graduate side. And I would actually have to be so specific with my applicants. I would have to say, your materials needs to get to me in enough time that the person who opens the mail for my department can time date stamp it so I know that it was here on time. And if you think about that, if you're sending things through the mail or if you're sending things electronically, you have to give those individuals time to process them. So if you're going to apply to a program, I would apply to the program as soon as the application portal opens. And then I would use that time to submit the GRE at least a month, if not more in advance, because you wanna be able to make sure, Madeline, that the, the tests that you took and the scores that you received are what you're happy with. And if you're not, give yourself that window of time to wait the 21 days to retest. But you have to think of it from like a, a business operational standpoint, if their, de if their um, deadline is May 1st, you don't wanna be just coming in under the wire, giving them your information. I would start applying early and I would send my scores early enough within a month or two in order to be considered. Cause most programs, you know, they will wait and collect all the materials and then they do the admission committee. So if yours gets stuck in the mail, uh, if it gets lost in the ether of <laughs> internet things, um, you could run out of time and I would hate to see that um, diminish your chances. All right, let me see if anyone else, there's another message. Thank you, you're very welcome. You are welcome to come off chat or to come off um, mute as well and ask questions. You don't have to just put them in the chat. Let me see if I'm missing anything. I don't see that I'm missing any other questions right now. Um, Dr. Kudali, I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't think anyone has any other questions, sir. Do you have any questions or any final words of wisdom you would like to share with us? Well, uh, firstly, again, we are deeply grateful and thankful to ETS. And uh, Don, we truly appreciate your insight and feedback. Uh, your presentation certainly provides a lot of rich information. And having the PDF later will allow the students to uh, go over the material at a slow pace. So again, thank you so very much to um, uh, 
you, Ms. Dawn Lipker. So please give a big shout out to uh, Dawn. She's done a fabulous job uh, for us Thanks. today and has been supporting uh, in helping uh, with these workshops for the past uh, year or more. So thank you so very much for joining with us students. Uh, we'll share a recording and uh, the PDF file uh, pretty soon. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of uh, the day and a happy spring break. We break for spring. Uh, oh, very nice. Thursday and Friday. So thank you for joining with us. And if you have any questions, I have put the email graduate.school at wku.edu. We'll certainly reach out to you and help you uh, with your preparation for GRE. So thank you all very much for joining with us for this uh, very successful and informative webinar. Thank, thank you. you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.